functions of a same word entropy and to show that we can use and keep the same word in all this context was not a trivial task so it was necessary to think quite carefully on why we, we are referring to the same physical notion of entropy so now the question becomes can we assign a notion of entropy also to the gravitational field and according to the pioneering works of Hawking and Bekenstein, the answer is indeed yes. In fact, in the 70s, Hawking published two papers in the Journal of Communication of Mathematical Physics. In the first one, together with Bardeen and Carter, they claim that the area of the event horizon is a close analogy which, uh, with entropy because uh, they derived uh, the question for evolution of a black hole as to be written in a form which resembles uh, very closely the first law of thermodynamics. In a subsequent paper, Hawking uh, showed that uh, the surface area of a black hole horizon can never decrease in time. So a quantity that cannot decrease in time is what uh, we defined as uh, to be entropy from a thermodynamical perspective. In the same years, uh, also Bekenstein suggested uh, that uh, we may assign uh, a notion of entropy to black holes. However, he followed uh, a different physical perspective because according to Bekenstein, entropy of black hole is a measure of information hidden by black hole horizon. So, you know, we have uh, an horizon uh, in a black hole space time. This horizon uh, can be crossed only when you move from uh, the exterior region into the interior region, not uh, vice versa, which means uh, that uh, from the interior region, we cannot reach uh, electromagnetic signal, so we cannot communicate with it. Consequently, you are ignorant uh, about what, uh, what uh, there is inside uh, the horizon. So we don't know the nature of the degrees of freedom of a black hole hidden by the horizon. The only things uh, we know is uh, the macroscopic parameter of a black hole, which can be detected by an exterior observer, like the mass and the lattice charge. But we don't know the degrees of freedom inside the, the horizon. Therefore, uh, in this case, uh, entropy is related to information entropy and specifically Bekenstein followed an approach uh, by Shannon. Remarkably, the same result as Hawking was obtained. The call entropy is given by the area of horizon. I emphasize the word remarkably because completely, completely different physical arguments were used. And so the fact of obtaining the same uh, result uh, was not uh, so much expected. Now we can assess uh, also to gravitational wave data set, uh, which uh, track uh, the merging of two black holes uh, into a single one. And by analyzing them, it seems it is possible also to confirm astrophysically that in this process, uh, the area of the black holes is not decreasing in time. So now we can, let's say, promote the uh, Hawking theorem from uh, mathematics uh, also to astrophysics. Then the question is, uh, to which uh, physical entity we are assigning this entropy to? And according to me, the answer can be found in a quite uh, precise way, way in another paper by Bekenstein. I think that uh, Bekenstein explained very clearly that uh, we should not confuse uh, the entropy of a black hole accounted for by the other law with the entropy of some matter field possibly existing outside the horizon. These are two separate notions. One is the gravitational field of a black hole to which we assign an entropy as the other law. And outside, we might have uh, some energy density of something else to which we assign some other entropy. Let's uh, try to understand the meaning of uh, this uh, sentence, uh, thinking about uh, Swatched. Swatched, the call uh, 
is an empty space time. Empty space time means uh, this is a solution of the Einstein equation in vacuum, which means the stress energy tensor is at zero. So we don't have uh, any matter content uh, supporting uh, the swatched uh, black hole. No matter, actually not even a, uh, a direct delta, but uh, we have a mass. We have a mass which uh, generates uh, the horizon. And therefore, according to Hawking back Einstein, we have an entropy. Therefore, you see, we can have a non-zero entropy even without having uh, no matter content. And therefore, black hole entropy. So black hole entropy means uh, Hawking Bekenstein entropy quantified via the area law. Is the entropy of a pure gravitational field. And it should not be confused with the entropy of a matter field outside the horizon. Because as uh, we can learn by studying uh, the case of a swatch, indeed we can have entropy even without any matter content. And as John Wheeler claimed, in general relativity, we can have a mass without having matter. However, now we face the first problem. As from basic physics, we know that entropy is an extensive thermodynamical variable. Being extensive comes with the consequence that we expect to scale with the volume of a physical system that it refers to. Nevertheless, we saw that for black hole, it scales with the area. So we would like to better understand why this is possible and reasonable. There is another way, possible way, of reinterpreting the Hawking never diffuse area theorems, which is in the language of a Cristo de Lurufini irreducible mass. Also in the 70s, and actually I think before the works of Hawking, Cristodolu and Ruffini proposed the notion of reversible versus irreversible transformations in black hole physics. Here, the meaning of reversible and irreversible is exactly as in thermodynamics. Reversible means you can bring your system back to its initial state. Irreversible means you cannot. For example, reversible processes are usually classical processes without any quantum effect. An example of irreversible evolution of a black hole is emission of Hawking radiation and evaporation of a black hole, which nevertheless is not a classical phenomenon because it requires also some ingredients from quantum mechanics and not only from general relativity. So by studying uh, such uh, possible transformation of black hole, Cristo Dolun Ruffini proposed the notion of an irreducible mass. What we did was to consider and to study Penrose's process of vacuum polarization outside the horizon. So with the polarization of the vacuum, pairs of particles and antiparticles can be created. The antiparticle may follow the geodesic motion within the gravitational field of a black hole and cross the horizon. By doing so, the antiparticle extracts energy from the black hole. However, Cristodoro and Ruffini found that in this process, there is an amount of energy which cannot be extracted from the black hole. And this amount of energy, they call irreducible mass, its square is the area of, uh, of the black hole. So again, by using completely different physical arguments than Hawking, because Hawking used and adopted the notions of uh, spatial infinity and of energy conditions, so something different than this paper. <coughs> We nevertheless arrive at the same result of the horizon area as being a quantity which cannot decrease in time. There is also a modern approach to this statement, which is the holographic principle proposed by Tuft and Sustained. 
according to which uh, a black hole is fully described by the area of its horizon. Or uh, more in general, uh, what matters uh, is the boundary of a system. But uh, as Bekenstein said, we don't know the degrees of freedom hidden by the horizon. We know only that they generate a mass and electric charge that an external observer can measure. We have uh, some uh, motivations also for um, cosmology for studying uh, gravitational entropy, which is the entropy of the gravitational field. And uh, this is rooted uh, on the wild curvature hypothesis proposed by Roger Penrose. And it conjectures uh, that the wild tensor should be a good measure of gravitational entropy. This is consistent with what we learned uh, as studying the Swartz in the space time. So, so let me move uh, first to this technical remark. In general relativity, the full curvature is provided by the Riemann tensor, which can be decomposed into the while and Ricci curvature. So the Riemann tensor can be irreducibly decomposed into a test part, the Ricci curvature, and a taste free part, the while curvature. Einstein equations of gravity can fix only the Ricci curvature once you specify some matter content, but not the while curvature. For example, Minkowski space-time, Swartz space-time, Kerr space-time are all empty solutions of the Einstein field equations. There is no matter content in this case. That in a geometrical meaning, we say the Ricci curvature is equal to zero. Nevertheless, the Minkowski space-time is different from a Swartz black hole, which is different from a rotating Kerr black hole, physically different, because uh, they come with uh, a different wild curvature. Or perhaps, if you are more familiar with cosmology, you can have uh, a Friedman dust-dominated universe. You can also have a Bianchi one dust-dominated universe. It's not forbidden by the Einstein equations. Or, let's say, a Bianchi nine dust-dominated universe. So you can have the same matter content, but still after enforcing the equations, you still have some freedom provided by the wild curvature. So the statement that the wild tensor should be a good measure of gravitational entropy is indeed consistent with what we learned from Hawking and Bekenstein paper. But they assigned an entropy also to Swartz the call, which cannot be a consequence of the Ricci curvature effect, which will be zero. And uh, therefore, uh, it should be a consequence uh, of a wild curvature effect. According to Roger Penrose's conjecture, it is expected uh, that the Big Bang singularity should come with uh, zero wild curvature, whereas big countries and black hole singularities due to gravitational collapse should have large wild curvature. So why should the Big Bang singularity comes with a low zero curvature in the light of this conjecture? Well, because of the formation of astrophysical structures at some later time in the universe. If uh, an astrophysical structure from form here in this uh, spatial domain of the universe, but not here, of course, obeying to the global conservation of energy of our system, our system is becoming inhomogeneous. The disorder of the system is increasing because we have some density gradient between different astrophysical domains. And therefore, the gravitational entropy of the universe should increase. On the other hand, during the collapse, of a star into a black hole, the entropy experiences a very huge growth. And uh, since wild curvature quantifies tidal deformation, this is the statement that we expect the black hole and big current singularities to exhibit a very messy and chaotic cur curvature behavior. 
So high, high entropy means something we see as we respect for our black color. And this is something analogy with the Bebelinsky platinum coverage fit description of curvature singularities. However, implementing the wild curvature hypothesis by Roger Carlos does not seem to constitute a trivial task. So let's review some literature proposal for achieving so. One possibility is to follow the Clifton Ellis Tavacol way of computing uh, the density of gravitational entropy cosmology, which uh, has been uh, adopted by several authors uh, for describing the formation of astrophysical structures uh, like galaxies, filaments, voids over density in late time cosmology, so in that field of universe. You see, this is uh, the time evolution of a density of uh, gravitational entropy, which depends on uh, many physical quantities, but uh, let me just single out uh, one of them, the one inside here. And here uh, we have also the pressure and energy density of the matter field of the universe. So this entropy receives contributions uh, also from the matter density of the universe. And uh, this, uh, therefore, does not uh, 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 enforce in a conservative way broader than uh, proposal. And neither uh, Beckenstein proposal that gravitational entropy should be something uh, which uh, depends uh, only on the gravitational field itself and uh, not uh, on the matter content of a space. Another proposal was to consider the square of the wild curvature tensor as the appropriate density of gravitational entropy. Some other authors show that this proposal works for five-dimensional Schwarzschild and Schwarzschild anti-decitter black holes, but not for the vessel notion space. Therefore, uh, this formalism does not admit a general applicability in black hole physics. And it seems uh, to be problematic uh, with respect to Bekenstein interpretation of a black hole entropy. If you remember, uh, I told you that according to Bekenstein, black hole entropy, given by the area law, should not be sensitive uh, to an energy density existing outside the horizon. So in started uh, black hole, there is no energy density outside the horizon. In the rest of Nostrum space-time of uh, an electrically charged black hole, you have the energy density and pressure of electric field. Nevertheless, according to this interpretation, you will expect entropy to be computed in the same way. Another proposal in the context of uh, an isotropic cosmology was to rescale the square of a wild tensor with respect to the square of a rich tensor. Nevertheless, you can use Einstein equations and rewrite the denominator as a function of the energy density and pressure of a matter field in the space time. So again, this is not uh, an entropy of something which refers only to the gravitational field. It is a mixture of gravitational field and matter field. So let me now write down the question we wanted to answer. Does an appropriate quantity guide function only on the wild curvature such that its integral over the volume of a black hole, provided the area, exists for static and spherically symmetric, possibly distorted black holes parametrized by this uh, line element. So this function uh, contains uh, some deformation parameters, uh, which uh, can be restricted, and uh, their numerical values can be found uh, by studying X-rays uh, data sets and gravitational wave data sets. However, uh, forgetting a first idea of my question, you can uh, think it to be zero and uh, just focus on the function f of r. 
f of r can be the one of Schwarzschild, the one of Reiser's Nostrum, the one of Schwarzschild antidesister, on which I'm not making any assumption. So, we want uh, this function of chi to be to depend only on the wild curvature because we want to enforce Roger Penrose's claim of a relationship between uh, gravitational entropy and wild curvature. We want to obtain uh, an area as a result for enforcing uh, the claim of Hawking, Bechstein, Tooth, and Sutkind according to which uh, the entropy of a black hole is given by the area of the horizon. We want uh, this guy to be the same for all uh, this type of black hole for enforcing uh, Bekenstein interpretation of black hole entropy, according to which uh, it doesn't matter whether we have an energy density outside of the horizon, and consequently neither the possible asymptotic flatness property should matter. And following the same uh, interpretation, we integrate over only over the volume. So I would like to emphasize uh, that uh, we are not looking uh, for new methods uh, for uh, computing uh, the entropy of a black hole. So there might be also many recent methods like uh, Euclidean uh, path uh, approach, uh, tunneling, formalism, and so on. We are not following that line of research because we are not disputing the area law. We, we have a faith in it, and uh, the fact that the entropy is given by the area is one of assumption of our work. What uh, we wanted to find is the density. So the keywords are entropy, then gravitational entropy, and now density of gravitational entropy. Or in other words, we want to find an explicit way of realizing, at least in some cases, all the previously mentioned literature requirements. And according to us, the answer is indeed yes, and it can be found by working with the Newman Penrose and the Cartana curvature invariant formalism. So the Newman Penrose uh, is just a mathematical way of uh, rewriting in an equivalent way the Einstein equations of gravity in uh, the language of uh, a null frame. And instead, uh, the Cartan curvature invariant are the projection of a component of a curvature tensor along such a null frame. So this uh, are Petrov uh, type D space time, which means uh, that working uh, with uh, the Newman Perros formalism, there is only one wild scalar different from zero, which is named Psi2. We compute uh, its Newman Perros derivative, so it means we compute the covariant derivative, but then we project uh, along the null frame, and then uh, we find the following. The ratio between uh, the derivative of uh, Psi2 divided by Psi2, when integrated over the spatial hypersurface volume element, give uh, the area of the horizon up to a numerical constant that we need to tune. So this quantity within the absolute value, because uh, it must be positive, is uh, our density of gravitational energy. So let me emphasize once again that we don't want to find, uh, we are not interested in, rec in uh, discovering what should appear here. So this side of the question is our assumption. What we wanted to find is what to write here. So we want to find the density. This is uh, the spatial hypersurface volume element, which takes into account also the metric factors. We integrate uh, over uh, the angle variables, uh, and then we integrate from zero up to the horizon. We stop uh, our integration on the horizon 
because according to Bekenstein, in this entropy, we should sum up the neurons we have about the degrees of freedom hidden by the horizon, not the other side. So our formalism is fully based on the wild culture, and therefore it is an appropriate result for a density of gravitational entropy, as according to Roger Penrose. We have not made assumptions uh, on this function f of r. So we worked uh, geometrically, keeping uh, this general parameterization for our vector space time. And therefore, uh, our formalism comes uh, with a general applicability to all black hole space times, regardless of whether they are empty space solutions or not. So we should consider uh, this expression as the density, both uh, for Swatid, Tessus Nostrum, Swatid anti the system. So having an electric field outside of the black hole doesn't matter because we are not using any field equations. Another consequence is that our formalism can be applied also to regular black holes. But then Heivard proposed some exact solutions in this case. And since we are not using any specific shapes of F, our results still follow. So what is the physical interpretation of this last sentence? But what matters is not the existence of a central singularity. What matters is the existence of the event horizon, which is indeed consistent with the holographic principle by Tufting Sassin, according to which all the relevant degrees of freedom for the dynamics live on the horizon. Let me discuss some other physical considerations. One interpretation is that the black hole entropy is a manifestation of tidal effects. I can refer to the paper The Gravitational Compass by Sid Zekres, published uh, in the 60s in the Journal of Mathematical Physics, in which Sid Zekres uh, provided uh, some physical interpretation for the Newman Penrose scala. And the Newman Penrose scala, Psi 2, Psi 2, on which uh, we are rooting our proposal for the entropy, is related to tidal effect. Furthermore, black hole entropy is a property of the focusing of light rays because we can use the Bianchi identity and rewrite our density of entropy as the spin coefficient rho. So don't get misled by notation. This rho is not the energy of, of uh, is not an energy density of a matter field. Is the expansion rate of a bundle of null light rays. Bekenstein himself uh, observed uh, that uh, this law, this quantity law, is uh, providing the change in area of, uh, of the horizon. So why was Bekenstein interested uh, in this equation, not in the area, but in the change of the area? Well, because entropy is a function of state. In thermodynamics, uh, a quantity is called a function of state when we cannot assign its value to a certain state, but only the difference between two states. So what matters is not the entropy at a given state, but only the change in entropy or the difference in entropy between two different states. So what we did essentially was rather than to stop at the zero or the level in the curvature, our trick essentially was to go at the first level by allowing also the derivative to enter our expression for gravitational entropy. So up to now, it was, uh, let's say, just uh, a guess. Let me, better than we check it explicitly, let me also try to provide uh, a possible constructive procedure for obtaining our density of gravitational entropy. Robert Wald has claimed that the black hole entropy is an other charge and provided a formalism for computing it. 
Here, uh, we are considering uh, Lagrangians uh, in which uh, we have uh, the Einstein-Hilbert contribution as in general relativity, plus uh, the contribution of a minimally coupled uh, scalar field. According to Robert Wald, entropy is essentially an areal integral over the cross sections, over the spatial cross sections of the horizon. So you see, we are integrating only over the angles. The R radial variable is instead fixed and it is on the horizon. So it is assumed, as well as we did in our method, that an horizon exists. Our formalism is based on a three-dimensional volume integral. This formalism is based on a two-dimensional other integral. So let's try to obtain our result starting from here. We want to convert this integral into a volume integral. Yes, sir? Um, sorry, why is the row of scalar field in that uh, definition is not important? What? It seems like uh, it does not take care of the scalar field. Just, yes, sir. Just volume of uh, sphere count. Uh, if it's possible, if we uh, define such entropy without scale field, yeah, in the other angle, other without this. Yeah. Uh, maybe setting it to zero. Uh, So you are asking if this formulation remains valid also when we neglect this, if I understand correctly. Yes. And uh, I'm not able to answer that right now. So usually, so in uh, world paper, uh, he considered the the more general case of non-minimally coupled scalar field. And inside this integral, you will have a function of the coupling, which in general relativity, this function will become simply one. And so this is the starting point in general relativity. Then how to extract maybe the Schwarzschild limit in which there are no scalar fields. From this formalism, I'm not able to answer that. Okay, so let's rewrite the areal integral in, by finding an appropriate current crossing the horizon. So we need to write here the normals to the horizons, one of which is outside the pointing, the other is inward pointing. And these are the frame vectors in the Newman Pembroke's formalism. Then, by using this normalization, we can find that up to a proportionality constant, this is our current, which would reproduce the horizon area. So, we want essentially, we want to have here negative one. So that at the end, we get R divided by four. Now we apply Gauss theorem, according to which we can move to a volume integral by replacing the integrand with its divergence. So we should take the divergence of chi mu and the divergence of this null frame vectors is exactly the spin coefficient of when we study static and spherical symmetric calls. And therefore, we obtain our result and we obtain also something more. Because if you go to the appendix in Walt's book, General Relativity, it is explained that when you convert an RL volume into an integral volume in General Relativity, the appropriate volume element to consider here is the special hypersurface volume element. Indeed, we might have also other options like Euclidean volume element, Isodoro Rovelli volume element. 
now this provides an explanation also of why we consider this specific volume element. If uh, you are still not, uh, if uh, you still think that uh, this is uh, just uh, a numerical coincidence, uh, let's uh, try to make uh, another test uh, to our proposal. So entropy should grow during the formation of a black hole subsequent to the gravitational collapse of a star which means that stars should have lower entropy than black holes. So let's try to enforce our proposal for one specific solution, which was discovered by Tolman. So Tolman published a set of exact analytical solutions of the Einstein equations for spheres of fluids in hydrostatical equilibrium. One of the uh, possible solutions is uh, this one, which depends uh, on uh, three free parameters, X, Y, and capital R. Capital R is the radius of a star. So also in this case, uh, we have a well-defined boundary of the system. In the case of black holes, it was the horizon, because it can be trusted only in one way. In the case of star, we have a well-defined boundary, which is the surface of a star in which context R is defined as the location at which the pressure of a fluid vanishes. So again, this is a pattern of type D. We compute the relevant newman penrose quantities. The integral, the radial integral, could be carried out analytically, and we obtain something smaller than the area of the surface. Therefore, our formalism is also consistent with the requirement that entropy is not the maximal for star configurations. Let's now discuss something in cosmology. So let's now try to inspect the relationship between gravitational entropy and wild curvature in cosmology. So let's consider one uh, exact analytical solutions uh, to the Einstein field equations. This is uh, a spherically symmetric space time, but you see now it's dynamical. We have also this function of the time. This uh, is a set of exact solutions uh, to the Einstein field equations of gravity, which were studied, discovered mathematically by several authors independently means. As you know, Einstein equations are a system of coupled, partial, non-linear differential equations. So already integrating them is highly non-trivial. And in those old papers, these authors were interested only in finding methods for obtaining solutions in terms of now, we'd like to understand if we can add also some physical meaning to this specific solution. So you see, we have something like a generalized scale factor of the universe. This function h of t depends on the time only, not on r. And it is a function also of two arbitrary mathematically constant a and b. We can obtain solutions both for closed and open topology, or actually this sort of them. This is an exact solution of the Einstein field equations supported by this matter field. The pressure is related to the energy density according to this equation of state. In a modern language, this will be a non-ideal fluid. And this function W, the question of state parameter, will be named as a chameleon scalar field, as a chameleon field, because its properties are sensitive to the properties of its environment itself as the energy density. Then we have a constant C. If this constant C is going to zero, you will have stiff matter. And the Zeldovich model for the primordial universe is based on stiff matter because stiff matter is the hydrodynamical realization 
av en massa skärfilter. Om vi hade det här ändå, så ser vi att when a C is non-zero, the pressure will be different from zero, even when the energy density is at zero. In this case, the constant C is named bug constant. Then uh, we compute all the relevant quantities of uh, this uh, spe space times uh, as the density of energy, the rich scalar, uh, spatial curvature, uh, expansion rate, uh, shear, uh, matter parameter, uh, while curvature, uh, deceleration parameter. Now we want to add the physics. Physics means uh, energy density should be positive and we obtain uh, some constraint. This means a constraint on the bugger constant in our physical interpretation in the question of state. Let's look at the Ricci scalar. Look at its denominator. When this quantity becomes zero, the Ricci scalar will diverge. So we will have a true physical curvature singularity that in cosmology we will interpret as the big bang. So we can uh, define implicitly the Big Bang time has to be this, uh, has to follow from this equation. So epsilon gives you the topology and H is uh, the corresponding uh, scale factor. Now I'd like to explain, so the first I take a common message of this and second part of my talk is that uh, we can use a thermodynamics uh, for testing a, cosm a cosmological model. And one requirement uh, follows from the cosmologic holographic principle, as formulated by Bosso, according to which the entropy of a physical cosmology should be bounded above by the horizon area. Well, otherwise we would have a black hole. Another uh, check uh, is uh, to compute the entropy of a matter field and to check explicitly that the entropy is increasing time as required by the second law. In this way, maybe our model uh, fulfills to use requirements for all possible triplets uh, of values of the three parameters A, B, and C, possibly for none, in which case we will add, or more realistic uh, for some specific values that, uh, on which we want to extract information. The second take at home message is that this consistency check can be worked out simply by pen and paper. So even without doing, for example, Bayesian data analysis of supernova data, cosmic chronometer data, CMB data, baryon uh, acoustic oscillation data, and so on, we can already get some information on whether our model might be a realistic description of the universe or not. Of course, those astrophysical precision then should be imposed over the restriction we find here. So the model should eventually fulfill all the requirements. However, let me try to explain a little bit how we can derive this constraint, as I said, just working with pen and paper. So for... Uh, for enforcing uh, the cosmological holographic principle by Bosso, we need uh, to have uh, to find uh, the area of the horizon. So, which means uh, we must uh, to find the location of the horizon, in which case it will be the dynamic apparent horizon. So, we must identify the area radius of our space time. The area radius is uh, the square root of uh, the function multiplying the angular part of the moment. Then uh, the dynamical apparent horizon uh, is such that uh, the divergence of the uh, aral radius, uh, its uh, magnitude should be zero. This uh, provides us uh, an equation. And the first thing we observe is that uh, this uh, equation can be solved only in closed topology. This is a consequence of the fact that once we impose energy density, when we demand energy density to be positive, we have already some restrictions 
o un web remover parameters. Other restrictions on the values of the free parameters come up because, of course, what you have inside the square root should be positive for the new value sign. Interestingly, we can go to the expression, general expression for the deceleration parameter in terms of the scale factor and enforce such requirements. And interestingly, he found that demanding energy positive to be positive and demanding the existence of a dynamical apparent horizon has the consequence that the deceleration parameter is negative. And another consequence is that it does not exist, there is not a big bang time in this model because the denominator of this curvature scalar is always different from zero. Then we compute the area of horizon, taking the square essentially of its radius and the entropy of a matter field inside it. You see the entropy of a matter field scale with the cube of R. It means it scales with the volume of a system because we have regular matter. We impose holographic principles, so we impose matter entropy to be smaller by the Venn horizon area, and we obtain a restriction of a bugger constant. So this requirement set a restriction on the question of spectral model. We can enforce the second law of thermodynamics to the entropy of the matter field. Doing some computations, but once again, we extract this information without need to do data analysis. This can be done working with pen and paper by theoretical physicists. We find that the second law of thermodynamics imposes a lower limit on the size of the universe, or equivalently, it can be recast as giving us a constraint on the edge of the universe. Then we compute the wild curvature, enforcing all the restrictions we found here, and we discover that it is decreasing in time. In the previous slide, I studied the entropy of a matter field. You see, I have a subscript M in the holographic principle. I have a subscript M in the second law of thermodynamics. Let's now try to study gravitational entropy in inhomogeneous cosmology. So why do we want to study gravitational entropy in, in homogeneous cosmology? Well, because uh, when the astrophysical structures, which can be galaxies, cluster filament, form uh, in some, uh, let's say, random region, the disorder of the universe is increasing. At the beginning, we will have all uh, the energy here and then it gets distributed and we will have energy contrast when astrophysical structure form, which means the disorder is increasing and gravitational entropy should increase. Furthermore, the relevant question here is what astrophysicists can measure is, for example, the Hubble constant and the present day values of the matter parameters. The question becomes uh, how many different uh, microscopic realization of the universe uh, are consistent uh, with the same uh, astrophysical result uh, for the macroscopic uh, param cosmological parameters. So in how many, different, uh, how many different possibilities do we have uh, for distributing uh, galaxies, uh, cluster filament uh, in such uh, a way that we will obtain the same values of H0 and so on. And this is entropy as from statistical mechanics. So here we followed the, the proposal by Clifton, Ellis, and Tavakol. Actually, this paper was published before the one on which we studied the entropy of a black hole. So this proposal comes with uh, some uh, sound characteristics uh, as, it, as it provides uh, 
an end of unknown negative entropy, it vanishes in and only in conformally flat space times. Conformally flatness means uh, while curvature is at zero. For example, the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walk universe for, uh, for a model of homogeneous and isotropic universe is conformally flat. And indeed, uh, we don't have any density contrast. Uh, and consequently, we don't have a formation of astrophysical structures. It is related to the local anisotropies of the gravitational field. So why it should be related to anisotropies? Well, because if a galaxy forms here, but not here, once we look at the universe along different spatial directions, we'll see something different. So gravitational entropy as for modeling formation of astrophysical structures to go together with the shear tensor. Then uh, we checked that it is consistent and that reproduces the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of a black hole, and it should increase during the structural formation phase. So this is how we compute it. Essentially, we needed to compute uh, the Wiles scalar say 2 and uh, the energy density and pressure of a matter field, all information we have. So this is uh, the time derivative uh, of the density of gravitational entropy, according to the proposal of Clifton, Ellis, and Tavakol. Then we enforce the specific result for the space-time metric we were interested in. And then we enforce also the restriction on the three parameters you obtain from the holographic principle and from the second law of thermodynamics. So in this plot, the values of the constant A, B, and C, which enter the mathematical solution of the Einstein field equation we are interested in, have been restricted in such a way that they fulfill the thermodynamical requirement. Now, let me try to explain what we obtain. Let's start from this last plot. Here, I am showing the time derivative of a density of gravitational entropy. So here, I have a time derivative, which is positive, which consequently means entropy is increasing in time. Let's now discuss this figure. Here I am showing you the evolution of a Psi 2, of a wild star Psi 2, but you see it is either both increasing and then decreasing in time. However, what we found, therefore, is that entropy, in, uh, according to this proposal, is uh, increasing even when while curvature is not. Mathematically, this is a consequence of evolution of uh, spatial anisotropies, which are increasing in this model. Because you see, according to Clifton Ellis Tower call proposal, also the shear tensor is put in by ends directly into the formulation of density of gravitational entropy. So it's this increase which provides the growth of entropy in this formalism even for while curvature is decreasing. However, uh, what we identify is that uh, according to this way of computing entropy, there is not, uh, let's say, a one-to-one -one correspondence between gravitational entropy and while curvature. We would uh, uh, we think that uh, Perot's conjecture should be enforced in a more conservative way. And therefore, if uh, gravitational entropy is uh, really connected to wild curvature, gravitational entropy should increase in and only in the time intervals in which wild curvature is. So something that we wanted to do is to compute gravitational entropy for inhomogeneous space times, but according to our formalism, and check explicitly whether it is increasing together with the wild curvature and the shear tensor, but separately. 
let me now provide some qualitative astrophysical applications for the models for the model we were considering cosmology. So a non-standard evolution of a shear may have indeed occurred at some stage of evolution of the universe because the standard model of cosmology is in tension with the absurd existence of a certain primordial astrophysical structures. So, scale the standard model of cosmology is about 150 megaparsecs. however data analysis from certain astrophysical catalogs have revealed and pointed out the existence of some compact object whose sizes are larger than the homogeneity scale of the universe. Furthermore, this uh, object have formed at a quite uh, high redshift, which means in the free model universe. However, if we apply perturbation techniques <coughs> over the homogeneous and isotropic prism background, there will be not enough cosmic time for uh, such objects uh, to exist in the primordial universe, such like uh, the larger quasar groups. So we wanted to find uh, some different uh, mechanism and uh, inomogeneous cosmology might indeed provide the trick. And furthermore, uh, also our proposal is consistent with uh, something dealing with uh, the primordial universe, because we are working with something like a stiff matter, close to stiff matter, which is equivalent to massless scalar field. So, let me conclude with some uh, open problems. One is in cosmology, in, in homogeneous cosmology, in which uh, we want to try to apply our formalism of density of gravitational entropy, the one that we found in the context of the call, but we want to apply it also in cosmology, and we want to check whether our density of gravitational entropy, the one I should do with respect to the while future, is increasing together with the shearing effect and together with the anisotropies of the universe. There is also an open question about the black hole entropy beyond general relativity. In the first part of my talk, I have made no assumption on the metric functions of the space-time f of r. So I never used that our is a solution of the Einstein field equations. Our is a fully geometrical method. This means that if we have some static and spherical symmetric black hole solutions, which means obeying to the same geometrical symmetries, but arising as a solution in modified theories of gravity, we will obtain our formalism, our computation, which will still deliver an area as a result. However, it has been argued that in modified gravitational theories, the entropy does not obey any longer to an area. It is a function of the area, or possibly it contains some logarithmic connections. Therefore, what we know is that in principle, a different combinations of curvature quantities should be adopted as a density of gravitational entropy. We don't know which, but we know that they should be different than in general. However, I tried to provide some physical interpretation for the curvature quantities in our model. Once we choose different combinations of different curvature quantities, also the interpretation would differ and change. It means uh, that it seems uh, that uh, the relevant degrees of freedom of the gravitational field are different between general relativity and modified gravity. And that's all for my talk. Uh, 
Thank you, Daniel, for this very fascinating presentation. And the floor is open to questions now. Thank you. Axel? Uh, in your formulation, mostly you uh, use for spherical and static backbone, right? Yes. Sir. So it is possible to extend to the stationary backbone, for example, one. Oh, yes. So this is indeed our assumption. Stationary black hole, for example, care, care Newman are rotating. We have axial symmetry. And Kerr, uh, Kerr Newman are still petrol type D. It means the only non zero wild curvature, the only, uh, sorry, non zero uh, wild scalar is still Psi 2. Of course, it can be computed by using software like Maple Mathematica. Also, its derivative can be computed. Now we face uh, a mathematical problem because uh, let's say we can set uh, we can set this integer. We can uh, find what to put inside here for for a curve black hole. The problem is uh, is uh, the end points of the integral. In curve, the singularity is given as r square plus a square so the angular momentum, times cosine square of theta equal to zero. The mathematical problem is that the singularity depends on both r and theta, so on two variables on which we are integrating. And we are not able to devise a, math a wise mathematical technique. So a singularity means something like a residuous theorem to apply for when we compute integral. However, now we will need a two-dimensional residual theorem because uh, the singularity depends on two coordinates. And this is a mathematical problem. So by so simply, if we follow this for uh, for Kerr, and we, are, we don't know what we don't know mathematically what comes up here. Uh, for example, other kind of black hole, which is static, static black hole, yes. which two horizons, for example, so in this formulation cannot be used. For example, two horizons, I guess, uh, less is not from uh, so when we have a mass and electric charge. In this case, uh, the interpretation of our method is that we assign an entropy to each horizon which depend on the area of the horizon. So in uh, one case, we stop the integration on the inner horizon. In other case, we stop the integration on the outer horizon. And in both cases, we obtain an area, the area of the corresponding surface. Okay, uh, can you repeat your argument about uh, why we should uh, con con consi uh, con consider the integral from zero to, uh, uh, to the horizon, not for the whole entire, entire space? Because it's just an assumption that we, we would like to integrate over the volume that map into like, the area of the horizon. Yeah, yes, <laughs> indeed, uh, other literature uh, integrated uh, up to spatial infinity. So this proposal uh, was indeed also tested uh, integrating up to R to infinity. Nevertheless, uh, according to us, uh, we should enforce uh, uh, this interpretation of Bekenstein. So Bekenstein uh, published uh, a sequence of papers uh, <coughs> on entropy of black holes. In, uh, in the first paper, uh, black holes and entropy, he found entropy matching the area with the constant form. But then in a second paper, 
generalized second law of thermodynamics in the cold physics, he further explained what this entropy is referring to. So you see, we have uh, an entropy for, uh, for the black hole and one for the matter field which will exist outside. However, the area is only to this, not to the matter field outside. And this is one motivation for stopping the integral at the horizon. Another possibility is also to look at its first paper and you see entropy is a measure of information about a black hole interior which is inaccessible to an exterior observer. So according to Beckenstein, the other law is quantifying the ignorance we have for the black hole. However, we know something about the black hole. For example, studying the Keplerian motion of some orbit inside, we know the mass of the black hole. We don't know the internal degrees of freedom. So we don't know the interior. So the physical meaning of, of stopping the integral between zero and R is that we are summing the ignorance inside the horizon. Okay, I have one question. Mm -hmm. like, uh, when you uh, define entropy of gravitational field in terms of uh, curvature to value quantity, that you try to mm -hmm. give a covariant definition, uh, as you said, there are different covariant definitions yes. provided by different people. What are the generic, some of, is there a generic guideline they follow to define, uh, to give some credit at such definitions? Yes, so another requirement, another requirement as from mathematics is that this function chi should transform as a scalar. Yes, yes. yes because integral are mathematically well defined for, for scalars. Therefore, we think that, for example, picking the component of a tensor will not be a good density of a gravitational entropy because it will not be mathematically a good integral. The integral of a scalar is well defined. The integral of a component of a tensor is not well defined. Therefore, uh, this is why persons consider this density. You see this? Uh, are scalars or combinations of scalars and uh, also this uh, are scalars psi 2 and the psi 2 are scalars in the newman penrose formalism so we have uh, they can uh, behave properly as uh, as integral and so the that integral you show that is yes. uh, for a black hole but yes. what about Suppose we want to define one for inhomogeneous cosmology. Mm. Uh, there, we, what guidelines would you use? Uh, uh, I would uh, still keep. Uh, I will keep uh, guidelines as for here uh, for having some scalars. So if you have, uh, let's say, a spherical symmetric spacetime, lemma theta non yeah. is uh, still a petro of type D. So the algebraic classification of space-time. Uh, Petro of type D means that uh, the only while non-zero culture is psi 2, and it also is a scalar. And also this derivative is a scalar. So this uh, fulfills mathematically the requirement. Actually, it fulfills also in the Zekres, uh, which are not spherically symmetric. Uh, because uh, they have uh, the correct, uh, they obey to the correct transformation law. And also, also uh, for static and spherical symmetric space time, also rho is a scalar. So, in general, rho, the Newman Penrose, is a spin coefficient. So, it's like uh, the Christopher symbols, uh, which are not uh, neither scalars. Uh, 
like the connections, so neither scalar nor the tensor. Nevertheless, uh, under a restriction of symmetry we have considered, uh, rho, rho is a scalar, uh, and therefore it can uh, come up, it can be used uh, as integrand. Then other guidelines uh, in cosmology is that, uh, according to me, other guidelines uh, is that chi, this chi here uh, should grow in time in the same time intervals in which the wild curvature is. And not also why? Because when we have a formation of an astrophysical structure, as a consequence of a collapse of some, uh, as a consequence of evolution of density gradient, tidal effects increase. So the wall tensor should increase. Mm. So formation of astrophysical structure means increase of uh, tidal effects, means increase uh, of uh, a suitable quantity, wild quantity, and also of entropy. Another guideline is that since uh, astrophysical structure form in different positions, uh, we may see it or not see it, depending uh, on which direction we look at the universe at. This means that uh, entropy should increase, uh, that chi should, should increase only when a suitable definition of anisotropy is increased, which can be some uh, shear invariance. Okay. Questions. <clears throat> I'd like to invite uh, Professor Kampikan to uh, a little can check your hand. Oh, okay. Then I. Oh. Okay, right. Okay. So, at least this is a present. Thank you. Yes. Okay, wait a little bit. Okay, how the. Okay, okay. 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 Okay, thank you for coming and for seminar and for this collaboration with us. Many thank you also for the hospitality, the many dinner and food experiences here. Oh, okay, thank you. Ah, this afternoon and this uh, weekend, I will not be here. Okay. I'll, I'll, you know, perhaps uh, some people yeah. can, can take care. Yes, I got Yeah, we have uh, uh, some visiting plan. Uh, Thank you.